Thank you. Is that working? No. Okay. Is that working? Okay. The third victim. I will speak slowly because in Australia apparently we don't speak English either. <laughs> well, my talk's about the flight programs that I've led in Australia and rather fortunately um, I've been able to lead a number of flights. Uh, but it, it does start with a, a different story and that was the fact that uh, we had in Australia um, wind tunnels or shock tunnels which was developed by a person called Ray Stalker. Ray Stalker um, well, unfortunately has died, but um, he was my mentor uh, back in 1985, and he had a dream of going to um, Mars. And the reality was that uh, he wasn't going to, that wasn't going to happen, not because he was going to die, but basically because we didn't have the ability in Australia to do anything like launch rockets. So out of that, though, um, he built a bunch of tunnels, and I won't go through them all because there's about six or seven in, in the world, uh, that's in the Western world at least, and uh, these tunnels were capable of uh, testing between about Mark 8 and about Mark 12. And uh, they still live today, and in fact that bottom one there, I, I, I did two and a half thousand shots in it, two and a half thousand tests in it, and they were basically around scramjet development. Now, with scramjets, and if you go to the next slide, you can see that I've, these are all the scramjets I've tested, there's various configurations. Um, the middle one up there, and I, I dare touch a button here, uh, I like this one here was the first scramjet I ever tested that went forwards rather than getting blown back. In other words, it had more thrust than drag. And it was the first time in, in history that actually anyone recorded more thrust than drag. So, that was done in 1993. You can see we looked at squares, different inlets, uh, different fuel ejection systems, went around in the end. So we went through the whole cycle of this. But the one thing that was a problem was that we had two to three milliseconds of test time. And there was a lot of people, especially in the US, where they had much more test time, they would say, that our experiments didn't represent anything like what was happening in reality. The combustion process couldn't, couldn't uh, um, basically work in that period of time. Now I was, uh, I'm a mathematician, and I looked at all the equations, and I would sit in an audience like this, and I would say, well, actually, all the equations tell you that you're wrong. And um, basically I would say this time and time again, but no one would believe me. And we all agreed to stop having the fight. The only way we could prove this was to do a flight test. And they knew very well I couldn't do a flight test. But I surprised them. And I did do flight tests, and in fact I've done a lot. So, the thing I had that no one else had was a place called Woomera. And I, 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 Woomera is a bit in the middle of Australia. And just to give you an idea how big that is, I, I put a map of Italy there. It sort of came out. Um, Woomera is an amazing place. Its, it's population is about 200. Um, so the only thing that's green is the football field. And th this is what it looks like at Woomera in the civilised bit. But we were very fortunate that the British and, and perhaps the Europeans set it up, but the British did set up a lot of it and blew up a lot of it with atomic bombs. But my point, but it looks like that pretty well across the whole of the country. Uh, and, but there is these basic assets out there like landing fields and rocket launchers. So I had that, I had access to that. Just to put the numbers on it, the range is about 600 kilometers long and about 400 wide. So it's a big bit of dirt. And um, we have total control of the airspace. So uh, it, it's a nice place to launch rockets, especially ones that you don't really know what's going to happen with them. So, out of all this came the flight program called High Shot. And High Shot had a lot of collaborators because we needed to get the money. And it was designed to show what was the correlation between the tunnel combustion experiments and flight combustion experiments. So what we would put in the tunnel was what we were going to fly. It needed to be a simple experiment. Um, 
and it needed to be the pivot. So what we did was we approached this problem, there was a problem in, right up front, was the fact that in order to uh, undertake the tests, we were going to use sounding rockets to boost it up to speed, but to get it to the right speed, we had to, we had two-stage rocket, the second stage we had to burn in the higher atmosphere so as to reduce the drag and get the energy into the system. If we did it in the lower atmosphere and tried to do the experiment on the way up, we just couldn't do it with the rockets we could buy. So we get through the atmosphere, then 10 minutes later we came back down again and between the altitudes of about 30 and 20 kilometers, we could perform the experiment. The unfortunate part about all this, it looks simple, but um, the rocket is spinning, and if you've got a spinning rocket pointing upwards as it goes out of the atmosphere, which is a good idea, when it comes down, it's still pointing upwards. So we had to do exo-atmospheric turnovers. It had to be all autonomous. Once it leaves the ground, it's on its own. So we've talked about UAVs and all this sort of stuff and autonomy. We had to deal with all that. The accuracy of this point here, where we were going to hit, was plus or minus about 60 kilometers. So the safest place to stand was exactly where we were trying to aim for. It was a big dispersion in, in what we were aiming at, what we were trying to get to. We needed angles of attack at the end here of about two degrees at the most. So the reorientation had to be quite accurate. We had a little bit of aerodynamics to bring it in at the end, but not much. The spinning rocket doesn't help it. At the very end, it uh, usually crashes and burns, and we go and try and pick it up. This is just an example of the technology level that we were at in, in 2000. It is the high shot engine, and it, acts, it has a, a combustion chamber here, which was rectangular, and on the other side, it had one which wasn't fuel. The fuel was hydrogen. It's very simple inlet, you can't see it really, but it's, it was just a, 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 a flat plate. And we had this really small entrance, and the idea was to measure the pressures and correlate that with what we saw on the ground. That thing there was about half a meter long. I put that up there too because I, I didn't have the luxury, this was done in AutoCAD, and I, I figured out how it worked with AutoCAD. Team was a size of four. We had four people working on it, and we had two years to do it. So you can see that we, we weren't hindered by technology. We had had virtually nothing, and I think that's a lesson to learn. Uh, pretty pictures are nice, but it doesn't fly. You need to get something simple. Injection schemes were four holes, angled at 30 degrees. We didn't go for sophistication at all. So, anyway, that's what we had. Um, we launched it after two years, and um, there's two rockets, and the payload was on the front. And this is our Woomera, and I want, I want you to remember this slide because there's these things here. Um, they, they actually killed that flight. Um, we had to go and look for it. Um, this is look how we were looking for it. Uh, as an engineer, I certified those ropes that they're okay for the, my workplace health and safety person. And we did have a rope up, up front here in case the car accelerated too fast. Uh, and I did lose that bike once and the rider, but I found him again. So that was all good. But the bottom line is it's not easy to find it. Uh, we did have an aircraft uh, which could circle for 20 minutes uh, looking for things, um, but then he had to go back for fuel. Now, we did find it and it was pristine when we found it, of course. And, but out of all of that mess, we could figure out what went wrong. And what went wrong on the first flight was those things there were sandbags. And they were placed around the launcher to cover up some wires. And they hit a wall, and the rocks from that went through the fins. And um, fins, or anyone in the Air Force will realize that holes and wings aren't very good especially if you're going to go supersonically, and basically it took it out. It crashed. So, a bit, bit disappointing, but then we launched High Shot 2 nine months later, and you notice no sandbags, less than blur. If you want to know what can go wrong in a flight, anything can go wrong in a flight. 
I think Elon Musk said, you know, a thousand things can happen in a flight, and one of them is a successful launch. And you've got to realise that. So there's some pretty pictures of it. iShot 2 did launch on, in, in 2002, and um, the bottom line was the data that we got was a one-to-one -one correlation with the ground test data. And then that what that allowed for the CFD people to then align themselves with the flight data as well as the, the ground test data. And so we managed to be able to correlate all our CFD as well, which was good. All right, so then we went on to um, bigger and better things. People realized that this was actually a fairly easy way to do flight testing, fairly cost effective. It cost in those days about uh, 1.5 million euros to do the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's more expensive now, but, um, but that's the sort of numbers that we were looking at. So JAXA, we, we ended up with a collaboration with JAXA uh, from Japan, and uh, they, let, uh, they gave us a, a, a launcher. Uh, they were doing another flight test, and they, you know, we said we'd take it off their hands. So we modified that launcher uh, to our needs, and uh, we did uh, High Shot 3 and 4. Uh, High Shot 3 was a kinetic, or the, the British, um, contraption that we were working with, and again, it was to correlate the um, uh, experiments that they had seen in their tunnels with flight. It was a bit more interesting intake. High Shot 4 was a, a JAXA configuration. It was really duplicating of, duplicate of what we did with High Shot 1 and 2. Uh, High Shot 3 was successful. High Shot 4 was not successful. The, uh, we had a problem with the batteries. Yeah. Life's like that. There's some pretty pictures of it. Uh, as you can see, most of these are rocket sh shots. The, the important thing is the rocket is supposed to be the bus. I'm supposed to be able to catch one whenever I like. That's not reality. Um, there are only a number of, there's only about two or three groups in the world that actually do this, and the front end very much affects the back end. Um, so you need to integrate the whole thing together. All right, so then we moved on to, DARPA got interested in all this, and they decided that, uh, that they wanted to go bigger and better, and when there was high cause in 2006, and uh, we developed everything that's from that point forward, and they provided the big rocket. So they wanted to go to Mark 10, and we successfully got up to Mark 9.5. And uh, we, again, we did, an ex we did a scramjet experiment there. They really introduced us to the, the, the round configurations. You, you know, the things that don't, it, within the scramjet world, you have to go round. That's the bottom line. And they had a, a fuel line and a fuel off intake. You can see it was quite large. Uh, we had a lot of difficulty making these inlets, but um, and, you, know, you can see Bandalay trips in here which tended to be a problem, but um, you can see that we also used a lot of uh, carbon composites. But again, this is just phenolic, wasn't anything flash. Where we had a problem with heating, um, we, bottom line was we didn't know what a lot of the heating was, uh, and I don't think anyone still knows what it is, to be quite honest with you. We, we, what we would do is we'd just hit it with some cork, some phenolic cork, wrap the cork around it, and let that burn off. So we just use the blade. As you can see that everywhere we were concerned about this, we always had an inclination, like here and here. We, we put um, uh, RTV, or Celastic, whichever we want to call it, around it to stop, um, to stop the, uh, the carbon burning and blanking off our telemetry signals. So um, we use simple, basic tricks to get it up in the air. But then it came along, was high fire. It was pretty obvious. What we were doing here, we, we were the payload was always attached to the second stage rocket, but we needed to understand how you actually fly a vehicle. So we put forward in the, 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 the problem in front of us, a simple goal, can we fly for 10 seconds hypersonically with a scramjet powered vehicle? That was the goal. And we wrote down what it was that we didn't know. And it was about 10 things. Uh, we didn't know how to do the aeronautics, we didn't know how to do the control theory, we didn't know how to navigate, we didn't even know what the heating waves were. We didn't know where the boundary layer transitioned, that was, we just knew all that. All the theory was probably wrong. And so we had to go and find out exactly what it was, and that was what high fi was all about. So, it was a series of flights, and, and to, to give you an idea uh, how we were, uh, we don't have meetings, we don't have big committees. I had a team of 14 people. To decide how the flight program was done, I was in, a, in an important place and the, the important person said, Alan, I like it, it's all good, um, don't spend too much money, 
Uh, by the way, could you please go down to the cafeteria, have a cup of coffee, and come back and tell me what the flight program is. So I went downstairs with my friends, uh, who was there, and uh, over a cup of coffee, we said, yeah, we need to do this, 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 and this. Came up with the flight program and proved All in the morning. You don't need a big committee. You know what you don't know. So, that flight program, the important thing is, stood pretty well through 15 years of flying. That's where it started. It was the idea. There was modifications. And we started with my fire one. Uh, and when we got through, halfway through that, I realised we didn't really understand their reorientation outside the atmosphere that well. I needed them to be much more accurate. So I introduced High Fire Zero, uh, which we did over about six months. But Zero was really to do exo-atmospheric control. One was to look at the boundary layer transition on a cone. We wanted to know where it was transitioning. Um, High Fire Two was an American program, and we don't have any of that information. High Fire 3 was an axisymmetric scram jet. Uh, it, no one believed that that configuration would work, so I decided to show them wrong, and I built an axisymmetric engine and tested it in the tunnel, and then flew it. High Fire 5 was, again, a very layer transition uh, flight, but not on a cone, but a more uh, flattened cone, elliptical cone, something more realistic. Um, and um, then there was scram space, which uh, some of you were involved with, which was which took this engine here and was to let it fly uh, to get the thrust. High Fire Seven was another scram jet engine, uh, and again we're trying to get the thrust, the actual, the actual thrust measurements. And the reality was High Fire Five crashed and burned, so we had to repeat that. That was High Fire Five B, and um, then it was High Fire Four, which I'm not allowed to show you, but you can look it on the internet and then I go for that. Um, but it was a pair of wires, and we did aerodynamic control. And there was a few others that, that went, followed all this, but that, that was sort of irrelevant to the program. So, bottom line was we went from a very simple cone right up to flying wires. And we did that in about 14 years. Uh, the other thing that came out of this was the Angelaya transition naturally it doesn't occur where any of the colors is telling you, any of the theory is telling you, it's occurring a lot later. And that's a really important find. As you can see also, the scram space here, most of you, or those of you who were involved with it, oh, it didn't go very well at all. Um, but uh, what I think the bottom line is, there it is, is that there are failures in a flight program. If, if you think it's all going to go smoothly, if you're a manager that thinks your team's going to have a great time for 14 years and it's all going to go well, uh, you're living in delusion. Um, the bottom line is one and two of these things fail. But when we got one to work, we got more than 100% success. Because all the things that we wanted to happen, it all happened. So the, the primary goals were met, but then all the secondary and tertiary goals were also usually met. So we made up for it. Um, this was a scram space, and most rockets tend to go to the right, and this one went to the left. And, um, uh, and then proceeded to go off the coast. And it's very unfortunate when someone actually takes a photograph of landing in a harbour. Uh, and this is some of the other things that you have to deal with, is the safety and all the other aspects of the range. So, in conclusion, uh, since about 2000, I've, I've done about 14 flights um, and uh, through all these different programs. We learned an awful lot. We went from uh, basically not knowing anything uh, to, to the cap capability to fly something. Uh, so uh, with that, you saw that there was a lot of collaboration involved, but it, it was mainly led from Australia. So. With that, I thank you very much. Transfer, and and we also had um, 
pressure transducers in there to measure really high, you know, around 100, 200 kilohertz, and you're looking for the different modes, but the, the bottom line was the thermocouples. Okay, thank you. Yeah. For your very interesting presentation, I have a, a couple of uh, questions, uh, information. Okay, I suppose that all these 14 flights have been uh, essentially performed in a sustained hypersonic flight for, for uh, scramjet and also for hypersonic. Uh, but did you have also some, let's say, suborbital flight or will you run? Can, is it possible to use your uh, facility for, uh, let's say, an animal suborbital, microgravity, for instance, or other kind of experiments? And then what is the, the range of mass, uh, for instance, in the movies? In the uh, okay, we, we work with Morava, but a lot who do a lot of microgravity experiments. And, and indeed, the approach is well, well established for doing fundamental things like that. Um, the mass you want to put on the front on the end on it determines your mark number. Right? So you drop the mass, the mark number goes up, uh, but then the stability goes down. Um, so it comes down to pretty well the minimum mass you can put on it is about 120 kilos. Um, the maximum mass is how high you want to go. You know, if you just want to go up the end of the rail and fall down again, you need to probably put a few tons on it. <laughs> Typically they work with around, depending on the rocket motor, but if you use a BSB-30, which is a good one, you can easily put a half a ton on the front end of it. And indeed, we, we put two 300 kilos on that, 220 kilos on that, and um, we were able to uh, uh, lift it up to mark seven and a half. And it does depend on your trajectory too, whether you suppress it or you go out of the atmosphere and come down again. If you want to do a basic experiment, going up out of the atmosphere and coming down again is a good way. But if you want to do something real, you've got to do suppress it. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, what will the future applications of scrounger engines will be in, in, uh, in the future? And uh, the second question is, uh, what will you, you and your team do in the future concerning these, these engines and these experiments? Thank you. The answer to that question is um, what? First one, what will the screen test be used in the future? Um, you don't know, want to know what they're used for right now, or do you want to know what they're used in the future? In the future, they, they, they will be used for um, uh, accelerating and also long cruising. We, we've seen a lot of that here. They're currently used, obviously, by various countries that talk about it um, for missiles. Uh, there's no two ways about that. Um, so. And, and this is just typical of any, any aircraft development. You know, if you look at history, basically it's going to repeat itself. Uh, there is no reason to scram. We have, the reality is, there is no reason hypersonic flight can't happen now. It's just about who wants to do it, what money wants to be put into it. So, and then we're seeing it in Russia and China, um, and even some of the US have released some information which indicates you know, that, that, that they're doing stuff like that now. So, my team, actually, as it, as it turned out, I, after finishing these flights uh, and achieving the objectives that we wanted to achieve, I, I left the team, and um, and I, I can't speak for them anymore because that's a defence team and that's not my area. What I'm looking at really is um, going on to uh, other technologies which may actually supersede these, these the current technologies. So where does it go from there? I, you know, the answer is I don't know. My, my crystal ball doesn't have enough batteries in it. <laughs> Um, that's, I, I'll look at anything, um, you know, I'm in a position now where I don't have to worry about um, following a stream, uh, so it's more looking at uh, actually bringing different technologies together uh, rather than just being concentrated on one, and uh, yeah, the, the one of the technologies is electric propulsion, um, but pulse detonation, engines is up there, the reaction engines is in there, you know, you know what's around. 
Uh, after 14 years of research, uh, if you can list two or three guidelines in order to avoid major mistake, would you be able to? There are no more laws. That's probably not all right. Major mistakes. Look, when whenever you do anything, there's a lot of people will tell you why you can't do it. What you've got to find is the one solution to the problem. Right? So you're not looking for all the problems, you're looking for the solution. And there's usually only one or two solutions, so it's easy to find. Right? But if you want to make a, a, a science project, right, it's really easy to do. Right? And you'll spend your whole life going around in a circle on a science project and wondering about something. But the reality is, if you want to fly it, and you want to fly it next year, you've got to find a simple solution to your problem and then put it up there. And, that's, and then believe in yourself. And then when you're wrong, admit you were wrong. Because right? if you try to hide it, um, you, you lose credibility and your boss doesn't give you the money. <laughs> so it's all about relationships, collaboration. And you know, it, it's a team of 14 to 20 is a big team. And uh, you, you've got to make sure that they're all motivated and, and talking to each other. Thank you very much. Can I